But I did mention that we're going to be having regular episodes and regular uploads every day. Grab your piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to the Bazooka. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is season three, revamped edition, episode five, obstetrics and gynecology. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at 10 OSCE stations in one clinical course. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. And just like the other videos, you may pause the video to write your answer down, to scream your answer at the screen before I actually give you the answer. And here we go. Station one, define third stage of labor. What is prolonged third stage of labor? What type of placenta abnormalities are seen in A, B, and C? How many arteries and veins are in the umbilical cord? What is the weight of the placenta at term? What is the length of the umbilical cord at term? So you may pause the video and here comes the answer. So remember that the third stage of labor is pretty much the period that begins with complete delivery of the fetus and it ends with expulsion, complete expulsion of the placenta and the attached membranes. Roughly the third stage is supposed to take somewhere around 30 minutes so if you fail to deliver the placenta after 30 minutes or within 30 minutes then you consider that as prolonged third stage of labor then these of course this one here is known as an accessory lobe of the placenta or you can refer to it as a succenturate lobe of the placenta then this one here is known as a second valid placenta remember that the placenta the umbilical cord is supposed to arise from the central disc of the placenta. Then here you have a filamentous insertion of the umbilical uh, cord. And remember that with this filamentous insertion, where it comes off from the umbilical, or rather the, the membranes, it's going to mean that this umbilical cord will not be wrapped in the Wharton's jelly, such that these vessels can even cross the ostium. And when you get rupture of the membranes, you can have bleeding, which is what we refer to as vasa privia. Now remember that the umbilical cord has two arteries and one vein. At term, it weighs roughly around 500 grams, or if you want to be specific, 508 grams. And the length is roughly about 50 to 60 centimeters of a range with an average of 55 centimeters. Station two, a baby is born with a heartbeat of above 112 beats per minute, no respirations, tone is poor, completely no reflexes and is blue in color all over the body calculate the apca score for this baby show you're working what is the significance of apca score at birth and at one minute what are the basic things you will perform to help the baby breathe that's supposed to be breathe not breather so you may pause the video right here and i just want you to go and search virginia apca after this just search virginia apca then remember that the APCA score, APCA is just an, an acronym that pretty much stands for A for appearance or the skin, P for the pulse rate, G for the grimace, uh, A for the activity, or you can think of it as a tone, R for respiratory effort. So if the child is appearing blue or pale, you give them a score of zero. If the extremities are blue where they have acrocyanosis, you give them a score of one. If there's no cyanosis and they're pink all over, you give them a score of two. It's rare that you, you may get someone who's completely pink all over, which is why sometimes at most someone gets a 9 out of 10 when they are born. Then of course the pulse rate is scored 0 if it's less than 60, 1 if it's 60 to 100, 2 if it's greater than 100. The grimace, if there's no response, 0 if there's aggressive stimulation for the child to cry or the child cries on just any stimulation or rather stimulation, you give them a score of 2. Activity, if there is absent or flop, uh, floppy tone, zero. If there is some flexion, one. If there is some flexion and even resists extension, you give them a score of 
2. With the respiratory efforts, you give them a score of 0 if there's no respiration, you give them a score of 1 if there's weak or gasping, and 2 if there's a strong cry. So you add the score, the maximum you can get is a 10 out of 10, the lowest that you can get is a 0 out of 10. Of course, someone getting above 7 would mean that it, it's a good score. 7 and above is a good score. Below 7, then you should have some a bit of some concerns. So looking at this question, the child is blue all over, so we give them a score of 0. Their pulse is greater than 100, you give them a score of 2. There's no response at all to any stimulation, we give them a score of 0. Then the activity, they are floppy, so you give them a score of 0. There are no reflexes, the tone is poor, you give them a score of 0. And there's no respiration, you give them a score of 0. So this child is a 2 out of 10. So remember that, the significance of this. Remember that we do the APCA score when the child is born, after 1 minute, after... Uh, five minutes and sometimes even after 10 minutes now remember that this is going to be describing the condition of the newborn immediately at birth and after birth so it's going to be actually providing a mechanism to record the fetal neonatal transition and the one minute score actually is going to be determining how well the baby is tolerating the birthing process and then of course the five minute score is going to be telling the healthcare provider how well the baby is doing outside the mother's womb and in some rare cases we do do the 10 minute score and remember that this is why i've even put it in bold or rather in in capitals it does not predict an individual's mortality it does not predict the individual's neurological outcome it just pretty much gives you an indication of how much uh, monitoring or how much activity you should offer to this child how much resuscitation this child needs so it's not really a predictive factor of neurological outcome so some things that you can do of course dry the child normalize the temperature so keep them warm because if they're hypothermic this could also be causing such problems stimulate the baby to breathe so you can lightly flicker their soles of their feet or you can just gently rub their back so don't slap them don't pinch them just do these subtle things then of course start positive pressure ventilation if they're still not breathing that's with your uh, uh, bag valve mask then of course you way back we used to advocate for bulb suctioning of course with your penguin sucker and this is not so recommended now and it's actually being phased out because there's a risk of bradycardia and there's a risk of aspiration if the heart stops start your chest compressions on your pediatric advanced life support you should also consider this when the heart rate is less than 60 but in this case the heart rate is 112 so there's pretty much no need for the chest compressions as of yet Moving on to station three, list four indications for drug A. So this is drug A here. List four complications for using drug A in labor. What is the mechanism of action of drug B? How is the maintenance dose of drug C given for severe preeclampsia? Then what are the complications of using drug C? So you may pause this video, look at the drugs. I mean, the name is already given on the container, Sometimes they may give you a blurry image, so you can actually identify them by their color codes. As you can see, this one is green, this one is blue, this one is yellow. And I'm sure even the same colors are there in the hospital where you rotate from. So here comes the answer. So before I tell you the answer, this is oxytocin, this is tranexamic acid, this is magnesium sulfate. So first of all, oxytocin indications, it's used in the active management of the third stage of labor. So pretty much to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. When someone develops postpartum hemorrhage, it can be used in the management of postpartum hemorrhage. It is used in the induction and augmentation of labor. And sometimes it is used as an adju adjuvant or an adjunctive uh, therapy in the management of incomplete as well as inevitable abortion. Then with tranexamic, uh, rather complications of use of oxytocin, you may get uterine rupture. You may get uterine overstimulation that may cause fetal distress. It may cause fetal death. There may be some maternal hypotension, and then of course you may have neonatal seizures. What is the mechanism of action of drug B? So mechanism of action of tranexamic acid. So remember that this is an antifibrinolytic activity. It prevents your, your blood clots from being broken down. So how does it do this? It's pretty much going to be binding to the 5 lysine binding site on the plasminogen and then it's going to be inhibiting plasmin formation because remember that plasminogen has to be converted into plasmin and then plasmin has to now start breaking down the 
the or inactivating the coagulation factors and also inhibiting the process of coagulation so the fibrinolytic system so additionally this drug is also going to be displacing plasminogen from the fibrin surface and it also directly inhibits plasmin and therefore also partially inhibits fibrinogenolysis at higher concentration then how is drug C given with this is magnesium sulfate? So there are two regimens. There's a pre charge regimen, which is what we use in our country here, where we give a, a maintenance dose of 5 grams as an IM injection uh, for hourly alternating with each buttock. If you use the Zuspan regimen, you give 1 to 2 grams per hour as an IV infusion. Then what are the complications of using drug C, which is magnesium sulfate? You may have respiratory dis depression, you may have loss of tendon reflexes, you may have muscle weakness, you may have flushing of the skin. Now coming to station four, mention the two types of episiotomy that are commonly performed. What, which of the labeled structures are cut during the commonly done episiotomy? Mention two indications for an episiotomy, mention four complications of an episiotomy. So you may pause the video right now to write your answers down and you scream your answers at your screen. And here comes the answer. So you may perform what is known as um, a midline or a median episiotomy. Now these ones have a risk of extension. The, the incision can extend to the rectal mucosa, to the anus. So it's a very big risk with when you do this type of episiotomy. Or you may do the one that's commonly done, that's your medial lateral incision. Now remember that you're going to be cutting through the vaginal epithelium, which is not depicted on the picture, your transverse perineal muscle, your bulbo cavernosus muscle, and your perineal skin. The perineal skin is also not depicted on the picture. Now, two indications for episiotomy if you get threatened a perineal injury in a prime gravida, if you have an elastic rigid perineum, if you have a narrow pelvic arc, if you have an elderly prime gravida, and of course in manipulative delivery such as a forceps as well as breech delivery. Then what are some of the complications? You may divide them into immediate complications and late or remote complications. Immediate, the incision, the incision may extend. You may have vulvar hematoma. You may have infections. You may have wound dehiscence. Then remote complications include dyspareunia, which is pain on sexual intercourse. Coming to station five, which are of course images. You have a lot of images in obstetrics and gynecology and you can't survive without knowing the imaging. So here, what is the mechanism of action of A? What is the commonest complication of contraception method B? How often is C administered? List four absolute contraindications of methods D. What hormone is present in device E? How often is this method of contraception given? So you may pause the video here, look at the pictures, write your answers down, scream your answers at your screen, and here comes the answer. So this is a copper intrauterine device. So remember that this copper intrauterine device is going to be releasing copper ions. Now remember that these copper ions are going to be causing an inflammatory response. And once they reach certain levels or certain concentrations in the luminal fluids of the genital tract, they actually become very toxic to the spermatozoa. So in this sense, they actually decrease the rate of fertilization. And even if fertilization were to take place, there are lower chances of survival of the embryo uh, being formed in it actually even reaching the uterus because the uterus is now becoming a hostile environment and of course the commonest complication that is seen with this is the irregular uterine bleeding then how often is C given so this is Depo-Provera which is Midroxy progesterone then this is given every three months then contraindications of oral contraceptive pills include breast cancer if they have a history of deep venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, if there's active liver disease, if there's previous arterial thrombosis, if they are pregnant, if there's use of rifampicin, this is absolutely contraindicated. Hypertension is rather a relative contraindication. What hormone is present in device E? So this is a hormone impregnated intrauterine device. So this is levonorgestrel. Then how often is a method of contraception given? So this is norethisterone, if I'm not mistaken. It comes in this type of vows we give it every eight weeks station six describe the standard procedure for listening to the fetal heartbeat looking at the picture what is the nurse doing wrong so you may pause the video have a look at the picture see what is going on and describe your answers to the screen 
I know it's a bit awkward, especially when you're alone, but it's for the greater good. So here comes the answer. So you want to greet your patient, introduce yourself, and gain consent. So position the patient in the supine position, ensure that they are comfortable, then there should be adequate exposure. So the adequate exposure ideally is supposed to be from the knee to the nipple, but in, in this case, for modesty's sake, we're going to be exposing from below the breast up to the mons pubis. We want to perform inspection in the obstetric palpation prior to the auscultation, unless if they just pretty much just are interested in the auscultation bit. Then you determine the fetal lie as you're doing the obstetric palpation, obviously. Then you're going to be listening with your pinard, which is your this fetal stethoscope, over the anterior shoulder of the fetus. And remember, you should apply the correct amount of pressure. Remove the hand from the pinard. As you can see, this woman here has not removed her hand here. That's one mistake that she's made. Then count the rate over a minute. She doesn't even have a watch, or maybe she has a watch on the other hand. Anyways, count the rate over a minute. Then note also its regularity. Then when you're listening to the pulse, make sure that you also palpate the maternal pulse so that you're not listening to the mother's heartbeat, which is what she's also not doing. Get an average readings and then of course thank the patient and cover them up and record your details. And of course the two things that she's not doing, her hand is holding the pinard and she is not palpating the maternal pulse. Moving on to station seven, identify the investigation shown below A, B, C, D, E, F. So this should be pretty, pretty straightforward. Very straightforward. Right, let me just zoom this in for you so that you can have an idea of what is seen here. So this is what's shown or depicted here. This is what is shown or depicted here. And this is what's shown or depicted here. Okay. So here comes the answer. So A is a hysterosalpingogram. B here is a semen analysis, not a sperm analysis, a semen analysis. C here is a full or a complete blood count with a differential as well as iron studies. D here is, of course, iron studies. E is a peripheral smear and F is an ultrasound. If you haven't yet come across these things, then you must either be very new to the wards or you don't go to the wards. I'm sure most of you have gotten this correct. Station 8. You are preparing for a handover round in four to five sentences. Summarize the labor of the patient who was just delivered using the pathogram to your consultant. This is very, very important. So let me just zoom this in. I know this picture is not so clear. My source didn't send very clear pictures. Apologies for that. So I hope you can actually make out what is being shown here on the screen. If you can't, then I'll explain it to my best of abilities. So the demographics over there, you have this section 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 here. So you may pause the screen, have a look at this, rewind, go over it. And here comes the answer. Okay, so first of all, you start off with your demographics. So this is MJ. I, I think this is MJ. I don't know if this is a Mrs. or it's an M, but either way, MJ. So this woman is a prime gravida. So she's a gravida one. So this must have been a typo here. So ignore the G1. Just say prime gravida because she's gravida one para zero. Unless if, um, if I can see this very, very well. They haven't given us how many weeks she's at. So ideally, you should actually add the weeks there. So at maybe... 37 weeks or 38 weeks. So she came in with intact membranes when she presented. Then she was four centimeters dilated and a descent of five. So the labor has progressed poorly. So as you can see, this, the cervical dilatation is quite poor. It has even crossed the alert line. It has even crossed the action line. Then, or, or rather on the action line. Then you have your descent also being poor your uterine contractions also are, are not so so good even the the frequency and the number is not so good so what was done for this woman is that the membranes were ruptured artificially here at 1330 and the lyqua was clear it's very important to note that the lyqua was, was clear even throughout the entire uh labor the lyqua was clear then of course oxytocin infusion was started at 14 hours we started with 10 international units 
at 15 drops per minute. This was later increased to 40 drops per minute roughly at around 15.30. And the contractions also improved with this. The maternal, the fetal vitals were, were normal. The maternal vitals were also within normal range. And a live male infant was delivered at 20 hours via spontaneous vaginal delivery and the birth weight was 2.65 grams. So that's like a summary of what is happening on this partograph. I hope it really makes sense. Station 9. Identify the surgical procedures A, B, D, E, and F. We didn't put anything for C. So you may pause the video here again. This is a straightforward thing. So here comes the answer. So A is a forceps delivery. B is a ventuse extraction delivery. D is a bilateral tubal ligation. E is a cesarean section. And F is a laparoscopic myomectomy. Now, it's never really an obstetrics and gynecology OSCE station if you don't have instruments on it. So identify the instruments. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and we'll call this one thirteen. I, I forgot to add the, the number to this one on this slide, but I think I added it on the answer slide. So this will we'll take this as thirteen. So you may pause the video, scream your answers. This should be a very quick thing. You should be able to answer this in five minutes. Within five minutes, even five minutes is very a lot. So two minutes, you should be able to answer this. So here's the answer. So one over here is a Cusco's uh, or Cusco's bivalve self-retaining speculum, or you can just say a Cusco speculum. Two is a Sims speculum or a Sims double-bladed speculum. Three is an umbilical cord scissors. Four is a uterine sound. Five is a sponge holding forceps. Six, a plastic suction cannula. This is a Carmen's type. Seven is a Doyen's retractor on the abdominal one. Eight is an ovard self-retaining speculum. Nine is a ventus cup. Ten is a penguin or bulb sucker. Eleven is an episiotomy scissors. Twelve is an ambu bag with a face mask. And of course, thirteen is a manual vacuum aspiration syringe. And here is our question for the day. Like I said, comment in the section below. I will pin the answer that I feel has the best comment. Describe the properties of an ideal sharps box. Describe how you would go about disposing of a sharps box. Very simple question, yet very dangerous. Thank you for spending your time to listen to this episode of the Bazooka. If you enjoyed, consider subscribing. Hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. See you in the next video. Until next time, bye-bye.